Mr. Tease, the Navy representative, had kept a close eye on you for the rest of your stay in Havana. You were taken to a large warehouse that was filled with hammocks across one of its walls and teeming with men from all stations of life, but mostly those with little to no social affluence or prestige. And if you'd been naive about your fate then, well, five minutes among the denizens here would have set you straight and quickly. Many of them petty criminals, and they knew full well what awaited them in Nassau and then Port Royal, Jamaica. They referred to the impressment service as rendezvous and Mr. Tease, who was their regular officer in the West Indies here, as their leader. His gangers, as they were known, enforced the often non-voluntary contracts that many of the men had fallen into, and the gangers predictably monitored the exits to and from the warehouse. They were not above using violence to ensure the men who'd been press ganged remained there. Many of the men here were volunteers, but the only way you could tell was by how the gangers treated these men versus the impressed, and where in the warehouse they were stationed. You would find out in time how much more appreciated those who volunteered were. They tended to make the best crewmen, and the reason the expression, better one volunteer than three pressed men, was so on point. You had discovered the full schedule of what was to become of you and the rest of the men. The ship in Nassau was apparently a brig that would transport you all to Port Royal. And it was here you were told that the British Navy had its West Indies squadron. Your discussion with the men upon hearing of your merchant seaman experience was such that they felt you would likely slot in as an ordinary seaman rather than a landsman. Your trip to Nassau, though, would not afford you much opportunity to showcase your acquired skills. Early on the next day, and with the West Indies sun already beginning to burn through you and the men, you were led to the dock, which you discovered was but a short distance from the warehouse you'd been stored in. You arrived just after 6 p.m. the previous day, and with the days being shorter here, could not make out much of the ships or the docks themselves. But now, in full daylight, you could see the sight with your own eyes. She was an older John Company ship by the name of Kuvera, which was the Hindu god of wealth. The Royal Navy apparently chartering her as a 56-gun, fourth-rate transport and troop ship. She was certainly a more comfortable ship than the merchant ones you'd sailed on previously. Her merchant captain, John Lowe, like you, a veteran of multiple passages to China and India, only considerably more. The ship left Havana for Nassau later that morning, and with an average of about 12 knots, maintained the 400 nautical miles in roughly a day and a half. The harbor entrances were located on either side of what they called Hog Island itself, just north of Nassau, and requiring a bit of maneuvering to pass through taking easily the better part of three hours to accomplish. As you rounded Hog Island, a few of the men pointed out the ship that would take you to Port Royal. While you didn't know it yet, it would be your home for some years to come. Her name, the HMS Hercule, a 74-gun, third-rate ship of the line. A true majesty from bow to stern, and you'd find out over the course of your time on board the ship that she was a French-built vessel in what was called the Temeraire class of ships. She'd been captured just 24 hours out of port on her maiden voyage in the Battle of Rodessau. A man by the name of Solomon Ferris was post-captain and commanded the ship. He had at one time been court-martialed, or so the rumors say, for the loss of another ship, the HMS Hannibal, but he'd been acquitted and had his sword returned to him with the wording that should he unsheath it again, it would be for use with the same gallantry he displayed in defending the Hannibal. He himself taking the Hercule to Port Royal, where he would start his commission as senior officer. The ship would leave the same day as the transfer took place in, and by afternoon the ship was making its way out of Nassau, 
and out into the open waters that would lead to Port Royal. You and the others who'd been assigned her were briefly introduced to the various officers and crew. The lieutenants, Hills, Perrault, Willoughby, Wolsey, and the head of the Royal Marines on board, Lieutenant Nichols. Your experience on the merchant ships with splicing sails and ropes have indeed rated you ordinary seamen, and you would be reporting to the boatswain's mate, a smallish man by the name of Mr. Baldrick. The boatswain himself, a lanky, strong fella named Mr. Addersley. And despite a rotund belly, Mr. Baldrick showed himself amazingly agile for his age, and the years of experience when climbing did show. Seeing him climb, though, with the others much younger than he, and often his belly being the first thing to be noticed, required much unearthly discipline. While you've a lot to learn, your skill in climbing and rope work impress him early on, and you set about aiming to learn everything and anything you can. Naturally, during your time off watch during supper leads to much conversation about where each man was from. You relate to the men the passage aboard the Augusta, which has them laughing heartily. The older men all seem to be able to relate to a ship in their past, just like the Augusta, and the interpretation of the term seaworthy being stretched to its limits on such vessels. The passage to Port Royal takes you south out of the Bahamas and back to Cuba, where you wind along its southeastern length before heading out to the blue open sea on a southwesterly course for Port Royal. The passage taking just over three days. It strikes you that the discipline required by the crew of a Royal Navy, very much in line with your natural feelings about such things, and you feel it should be in place for all vessels at sea. During your time with McGee, it used to bother you no end when the men dawdled and took their time getting to duties. You, however, would simply escape in your duties and in your mind. Outwardly, the hard-working boy to everyone else, except McGee, of course, but inwardly, a way of coping and losing yourself in your work. Here, it was the norm. It was expected to the point that if you didn't move quickly enough, a bosun's mate would be happy to move you along with the help of a heavy knotted rope's end. This, known as starting the men you were told by your messmates. All of the bosun's mates were right brutal bastards with the exception of Mr. Baldrick. But one of them truly loved to start the men and give them a gobstopper for rudely answering back to officers. The gobstopper consisting of one of the balls of an out-of-charge grape shot which was shoved into the man's mouth, secured with a couple of bandanas, wrapped around his head, and then tied off at the back. It usually stayed in place until dinner. Despite the brutality inflicted on the foremast jacks for any and all infractions, for you, this life was a much more natural fit. One of your fellow seamen, who was impressed shortly before you, a book merchant who was learned and had traded in the area. He knew much of Port Royal's history, of which you were endlessly fascinated. You recall how during the Last Supper on the ship, you'd peppered him with questions, and he happily answering them and adding tales of his own. He told you fantastic tales about the time when it had been a privateer's haven. Oh, <laughs> every day was a celebration. Men drinking at all hours, even the animals took part in the festivities they did. My God, what a sight it was. Parrots, little monkeys, all at the favourite perches, drinking with the men. He also spoke of the great earthquake that struck the port in the late 17th century. 2,000 men had died and many more after it was over from the Yellow Jack. He told of a wall of water that suddenly surged out of the sea, blanketed the port, and then dragged almost every building in the port back into the water with it. And the priests? Well, they reckoned it was the work of God, 
as a direct result of his displeasure at the hedonistic and godless lives lived by the pirates and the residents who cater to him. You'd been ordered to shorten sail and were working the ropes of the mizzen when Port Royal slowly emerged into view as the ship meandered its way around the southeast end of the port. While some of the ships were on patrol, the majority were here at the Royal Navy Dockyard. Six frigates and over a dozen brigs, sloops of war, and other assorted vessels. To the side of the dockyard, the building that you would learn was the Naval Hospital. There was a lot of new construction activity going on everywhere and provided an answer as to why so many inquiries were made about sailors with woodworking and carpentry experience. By the end of the month of February, you were growing accustomed to your life on the ship. Sleep during multi-day exercise drills in the waters off Port Royal came in but four-hour stretches. Each man would alternate between two hammocks to sleep in as well, washing one while the other was in use. As with all that you touched on the ship, though, there was an odd fascination of requiring everything to be washed. Urine collected in buckets by the seamen's toilets in the bow, several of which would then be placed in a tub, and a man, usually a landsman or seaman serving punishment, then stomped the hammocks or clothing inside with his feet. They were then eventually dried. Strange and eccentric to you, though, was the requirement of having to bathe as frequently as once per week. You and the men certain that this leaching the body of its natural oils served no good. Before each four hours of sleep, the ritual was the same. First, the hammock was collected from the storage nets on the upper deck. Then it was hung by first removing the iron rings that held the roll tight. And the entire process, 15 minutes before each sleep shift, would be done in reverse and the hammocks return back to the nets that stored them. You learned to get the deepest sleep possible during watch and watch shifts. Any sleep cycle done in the early morning had you ready an hour before sunrise as the bosun and his mates began rousing all the men out of their hammocks to holly stone and swab the decks before flogging them dry with the sun casting its light on anything less than a spotless deck on the Hercule. Then it was breakfast. Then whatever other duties the day would begin with, as with all the men keeping an ear open for the Pfeiffer to begin playing Nancy Dawson, because you all knew that the grog was being mixed and about to be issued. Always possessing a keen eye and memory, and as adept as ever up high in the cross trees, you had the perfect vantage point from which to soak up Navy life extras. Of particular interest to you was the flag signaling practice taking place. The midshipmen, old and new alike, were constantly scribbling notes and consulting their signal books, as the system used was still quite new, you'd heard. From your perch, you were able to learn along with them, albeit at a discretionary pace, as you still needed to do your own duty and do it well. They referred to the signaling system as Poppins. While you weren't sure who he was, the underlying purpose soon began to make sense to you. Flags would be used in various combinations, with each representing words and even phrases. There was no word or phrase available, then the flags could be further used to represent individual letters. In this way, full sentences could be created fairly quickly. They were also used as a way to ensure that the ship approaching you flying the British flag was in fact really a British ship by sending a special coded signal and waiting to receive the correct reply in response. You began to see the patterns of familiarity in the signals being displayed and the words and phrases that they referred to. Near the end of March, you were so adept, you had to bite your tongue hard when the midshipmen would pause and have to consult their books and then debate among themselves the meaning. Food on board the Hercule, also better than anything you tried outside of your hometown or canton. Beef served twice on Tuesdays and Saturdays, pork twice Sundays and Thursdays. Daily, 
biscuit, which alternated with peas and oatmeal every other day. Then, of course, the beer, at a gallon per day. You found, though, too much and your balance was impacted when climbing. You developed a strong friendship with many of the other Miz and Topsmen, one of them a lad named Eric, who's a year your junior. He's from London, and his life had been exceedingly hard. But you find much in common with him, as like you, he's a quick study and hardworking. Most of the men on board were pleasant enough, but as would seem the norm on any ship, there was always the exception. And on the Hercule, that exception was the midshipman by the name of Thomas. He had a wickedly mischievous disposition whose sole delight was to insult the feelings of seamen and furnish pretexts to get them punished. He was a youth of not more than 12 or 13 years of age. You'd often see him get on the carriage of a gun, call a man to him for the slightest of infractions, and then kick him about the thighs and body with his feet, beating him about the head, and, though prime seaman, them daring not to murmur for fear of retribution. Throughout the last months since your arrival, tensions have been felt involving the stability of the treaty with the French. Lots of murmurings and discussions taking place. Additional ships as well, including those of the line, have arrived at Port Royal. In the last week of May, while on one of the exercise passages, Captain Ferris fell ill. And by the second day, he'd gotten worse and was transferred from the physician's care to the hospital. But he would die that same evening. He was given, as accorded by the Navy, a proper send-off. And while you had no real close proximity to the captain, he was a man no one on the ship spoke ill of, despite the rumors of his history. And certainly did not speak ill of after his passing. Lieutenant Hills assumed acting command. By the middle of June, the men told that war with France has resumed thanks to Boney's treachery in Switzerland and his sending of an expedition to Sédomé. Unbeknownst to you at the time, preparations were already being made for the Hercule to act as one of the three ships of the line for a large British convoy that was to patrol the waters near the two principal northern French ports on Sédomé. The ports of St. Nicholas and Francis. On the 18th of June, two squadrons sent to enact a blockade of the aforementioned ports. Your ship, the HMS Hercule, still under the acting command of Lieutenant John Hills, was part of the first squadron, along with two other 74-gun ships of the line. The HMS Cumberland, under Captain Henry Bainton, the HMS Goliath, under Captain Charles Brisbane, your squadron, heading towards St. Nicholas in the west. And what a sight it was to behold. You'd seen ships, many ships in your history, many ships docked at foreign and ports close to home alike, but nothing could prepare you for this sight. Fifty ships in a massive line stretching as far to either side, fore and back, that you can see. The second squadron was also being led by three 74 gunships of the line. The HMS Bellafron, commanded by Commodore John Loring, the HMS Elephant, under Captain George Dundas, and the Theseus, under Captain John Bly. The HMS Vanguard, under Captain James Walker, trailed those other three, and accompanying both squadrons, multiple smaller rate vessels. The French had apparently sent their general named Leclerc to curtail the separatists in Sédomé. They were being led by an escaped slave, a general named Toussaint Louverture. The tension among you and your fellow seamen? Obvious. Despite the confidence of leadership, the reality has dawned on most of the men that they may have to engage in fighting and what remained of a man cleaved in twain by cannon shot or riddled with wood splinters was not a pleasant sight. 
aside from the noticeable tension, the seas and the weather itself, though, were calm, and no enemies had been spotted thus far on the patrol. During your watch, in the early hours of June 28th, events would take a sharp turn. Lookouts on your ship spotted two unidentified sails in shore. Your 374 gunners leave the convoy to investigate, with your ship the Hercule in lead on the formation. A few minutes before 8, the two ships are identified as a French frigate and corvette. After the bosun's word to be passed is piped, Lieutenant Willoughby, who is also signaling officer, then gives the order for the other ships to receive the signal that French ships have been spotted. The flag for France, however, becomes stuck on the main mast. Efforts by those below to free it result only in the flag beginning to tear. The order is then given for one of the main topsmen to free it manually, and he climbs the main mast and begins to attempt to clear it by tugging gently at first and then more vigorously before the terrible happens. On one such strong tug, he loses his grip and falls, striking his head on a beam, causing it to snap unnaturally to the side and with a sickening bone-splitting sound before falling to the deck below with a dull thud. You'd instinctively try to reach out in response to aid, but given your distance, could not have hoped to stop his momentum. You do, however, continue to swing the beam you are on to the main, and as you draw closer, you see the obstacle catching the signal flag rope is a splinter bulge off of the main beam attachments. Without hesitation, you twist it free, and the men below are able to hoist it into place. You realize on your way down that you'd acted purely on adrenaline, and now we're beginning to comprehend what had just happened. Many of the men still shocked at seeing one of their own lifeless and losing blood at an alarming rate. Two of the men quickly move to pick him out of the way, with one slipping in the blood and falling beside him before regaining his balance and hauling their fallen comrade away. Your ship then hoists its colors, which in turn prompts the ship you would find out later was called Poursuivant to hoist her French colors. It would seem that battle was now about to be initiated. Here ends part four of the life as a British seaman in the Napoleonic era. Part five will prove to be epic and I cannot wait to share it with all of you. Please, if you enjoyed this video and if you haven't yet, you should subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this. Thanks for watching and as always, until the next video guys, cheers.